All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hour Hangouts. My name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts, uh, where webmasters, SEOs, publishers can join in and ask any kind of website search-related questions that might have come up. Um, looks like a handful of people here are here already, but I'm sure we'll see more over time. A um, bunch of questions were submitted already on YouTube, so we can go through some of those. But uh, like always, if any of you want to get started with the first question, you're welcome to jump in now. Or if not, hi John. Go for it. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah. Oh, hi, Martin. Great to see you as well. Uh, John, um, I had a quick question about cloaking, basically. Um, and, the, um, uh, and the context is that uh, we, want, uh, we want to add tracking parameters to our internal link structure. And like it's always said that adding too much might not be good because it delays crawling and it might be not good for a million uh, URLs website, which we have. So the data team has suggested that uh, when someone clicks a URL, they add it on um, on the go, and they block the bots from accessing those parameters uh, by identifying user agents. So is that is that a permissible technique? Because the content remains the same, just that the tracking parameters are added for the users and not the bots. Um, in general, I mean it's it's permissible. Like you you can do this. I I think it's probably not a great practice, but uh, in gen in general it's doable. It's essentially similar to the old session IDs that used to be used in in the old days, uh, where per session you would add parameters to to the links on a page, and then when when a user clicks on those links, those session parameters would be passed on, uh, so that you can track. That, that a little bit better. In, in general, for crawling, that's something that makes sense to suppress so, so that search engines don't run across those. Um, what I would not do is block them by robots text, but instead maybe use a rel canonical on those pages to, to point at the canonical version, um, or maybe even redirect to, to the canonical version if you can do that. Uh, in, in general, I try to avoid doing this kind of tracking through the URL itself, because it makes everything a little bit messier. Because then when you look at your log files, it's a lot harder to tell which, which are the pages that actually get the most traffic. How do users in general navigate around my website? Because you always have these kind of tracking parameters attached to, to the URLs, depending on the user, depending on how they came in. So I think. It's, it's probably suboptimal to do it like that. It's not illegal in any sense or against the webmaster guidelines or anything like that. It's just, I, I'd say, not a, not a great practice. Kaljan, thank you so much. And I hope everyone is safe uh, at this. Is. Thanks. Cool. Any other questions before we jump in with the rest? Hey, uh, hey John, I have a question. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, my question is just that I want to clarify how uh, keyword cannibalization actually works. Is the whole concept of keyword cannibalization is just referring to uh, a concept to describe it's counter, uh, counterproductive to target the same keyword with two page, or it's actually an algorithmic penalty for two page target the same keyword. So for example, if I rank for like top four uh, for a page, if I publish another page, uh, Targeting the same keyword, will it drag down the top uh, top four uh, ranking, or it's just counterproductive to do, to publish another page um, to target that? Yeah. Um, so there's there's no penalty for doing that. It's not that there's any kind of manual action or any algorithmic action that would say, oh, you have two pages, therefore they can't be as good. Uh, most of the time, the the issue just comes up in that. You, you tend to have two pages that are somewhat kind of midterms with regards to, to how good they are, how strong they are. And uh, if the alternative is to have one page that is much stronger, that could potentially rank better than any of those pages individually, then you're, you're kind of trading off having two pages shown in search, but they're a little bit lower in the rankings versus one page that's shown a little bit more visibly in search. Uh, so 
in, in that kind of a trade-off situation, often you will prefer to rank a little bit higher just because you're a little bit more visible in that case. Uh, there are many cases where essentially there would be no change in ranking, where maybe the, the top results are so strong that there's no chance for you to kind of jump in there by combining your pages. Or maybe you're already like ranking number one and number two, or number one and number three. Then it's not that you would be ranking better than number one uh, if you just had one page. So it's from, from that point of view, it's always something where I think it's a good idea to look look at this, uh, but also to keep in mind the context and to think about what the alternative would be. So don't just blindly see it as something that is bad and you need to fix, uh, but rather think about what, what would the alternative be? Would it be better for my site if I had one page, or does it, does it not change anything at all, perhaps? I see. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. Any other questions before we jump on in with the rest? I have another question, if you don't mind. Uh, All right. Go for it. So, uh, so is it a bad idea that uh, we always uh, use non-canonical URL in the internal link? So, for example, especially when we, uh, if we, we implement internal link, it's always have like a, a, a parameter that, and that parameter um, uh, canonicalized to the one without. And uh, I see a lot of websites doing this kind of link throughout the site. Would they hurt their page rank flowing? doesn't hurt the, the page rank flow or the, the page rank of the pages in that sense, because we, we see those multiple URLs, and we see they're the same content. They have a rel canonical, so we treat them as one page. Uh, what can happen, however, is that we pick one of these URLs to use as a canonical instead of the one that you have specified as the rel canonical. So that's something which. Sometimes you'll see these URLs in search if you do a site query or if you search for them specifically. Uh, sometimes you'll see them in Search Console and the reports. And uh, it essentially just makes it a little bit harder for, for you to kind of keep track of things because you're looking essentially at both of these URLs and saying, well, in, in my mind, I have to keep, keep in mind that these are the same URLs uh, when actually they're multiple URLs, where you could make it easier just by having one single URL. Uh, but that's that's essentially something where, from a ranking point of view, it wouldn't change anything. It's really just make, making it easier for you to understand your site. OK. Is that is it also make Google easier to identify which one is canonical if I link them directly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we pick a canonical, we use the rel canonical. Um, we use internal and external links. We use redirects, uh, a bunch of other factors as well to pick a canonical. So if the rel canonical points at one URL and the internal links point at, at another one, then we're kind of in a conflicted situation. I see. So, so follow, up, follow up on that. Um, uh, is that uh, so in Google Merchant Center, they have a seat, right? Is that a bad idea to use canonicalized link in the Google Merchant Center's link? Uh, or is that should we use uh, the actual product page that is canonical in the Google Merchant Center's feed? I don't know for sure. Um, I, I need to kind of check out all of these details with the, the Merchant Center team uh, because they've They've kind of opened things up and gone towards the direction of kind of more organic search results, at least in the US. Um, but I, I don't know what, what their recommendations are uh, in detail. So I need to double check that everything is the same. I see. So if I have a question specifically for Google Merchant Center, what is a, a, a canonical resource that I, I can go to? Is that a person or a group uh, that I can get a authoritative answer for? It? I don't know. I don't know at the moment. I I need to look that up. It it might be that uh, as as a first step that maybe the the Google Ads team would be a good uh, guess because that's kind of where the Merchant Center so far has been located. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, John, can I follow up a bit uh, on that last question regarding internal links and canonicals? Sure. Um, so uh, let's say that you've uh, um, you have this uh, internal linking where all links point to those uh, pages that also canonicalize to other pages. 
uh, but you figure out canonicals and respect them and everything is okay from that point of view. Do they still use uh, crawl budget? Is, uh, is this, uh, I mean, uh, fixing that and putting the actual canonical version uh, would help with the crawl budget or that doesn't make any difference? Um, you still need to crawl those yeah. canonical, non-canonical version every now and then because they're they're within the internal linking architecture or do you kind of figure out, oh, I know what is, this is about. I won't really bother crawling that page. We, we do still look at them from time to time, but it's not, not as often as we would crawl normal URLs. So usually what happens when, when we have a set of URLs and we pick one URL as canonical for that set, then we will mostly focus on that single URL and crawl that one primarily. We'll still occasionally look at the other ones, um, but it's not, not nearly as much as kind of the normal crawling would. So when it, when it comes to crawl budget, it's something where initially we would look at all of those different URLs. So if you went to a big site and you started adding session parameters again to all URLs, then initially we, we would get lost with crawling. Uh, but fairly quickly, we would figure out, OK, these are the canonical URLs. These are non-canonical URLs. We will focus on the canonical ones. And that should more or less still work out. But do internal links play any role here? So if you have internal links or not to those non-canonical URLs, does that affect how often you'll recrawl, even if rarely, uh, those uh, versions? Um, well, the strong from the, the difference between canonical URLs is true. We'll focus on the canonical URLs. But if the difference, if, if it's kind of like 50 50, like we choose these or we choose those, and it's, it's possible that we will like recrawl those non canonical URLs a little bit more often than URLs that we think are completely irrelevant. OK. Uh, so uh, is that the case with like redirects as well? So if you're internally linking to a page that always redirects to something else, uh, does the internal link? Should you replace that with the final version, or uh, you'll kind of manage it on your own end? It doesn't matter if you internally link to the redirect page or to the final destination. Um, I I imagine you would see something similar. I I think in practice this this difference is is more theoretical than it is practical. Um, if like if if you have access to the server logs of a bigger site, you can probably find pages like that where you know. You're linking to a redirecting page, and you can you can double check to see what what the amount of crawling actually is there. I imagine for the most part we just figure this out and we pick the the canonical and we focus the crawling really primarily on that. So I I mean I I don't have any numbers to to throw out, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's uh, like I don't know. 30 to 1 or some some really strong ratio like that, where we'd say we really focus on the canonical URLs. And every now and then, we'll still look at the non-canonical ones, regardless of, of where they came from. OK, I'm, ju I'm just asking whether you know if you have a very big site and it's linking to all of these pages that either redirect or canonicalize to something else, whether it's worth the effort going you know, URL by URL, or you know, maybe some automatic way to try to replace everything so it leads directly to the final version. Where, whether that's worth the effort. I think if you have a really large site and you're doing this on a large scale, I would clean that up. Uh, like, if, if if let's say I don't know if YouTube had redirects from all of the old pages to new ones and the internal links still went to the old pages. That's something I would say is, is worth cleaning up, because there are just so many of those URLs. And if we keep running into the old ones and keep trying them, then it's just adding such a mass of uh, unnecessary crawling. Uh, but if you have a normal-sized website, even kind of like a mid-sized e-commerce site with, I don't know, a couple million URLs, I don't see this playing a, a practical role. OK, thanks. Sure. All right, let me look at some of the questions that were submitted. And feel free to jump in in between as well. Or if you have more questions or comments on the, the questions or answer, we can take a look at that. 
Um, I heard Googlebot sometimes submit forms. If so, could it do it if the form is in an iframe as well? And what if the iframe is hosted on another domain? How would that impact crawling, indexing, and so on? Uh, so it's extremely rare that Googlebot would submit a form. Uh, it's something where it, we, we primarily did this way in the beginning when websites were structured in a way that we could not crawl them properly. Uh, in particular, we saw this issue on a lot of government websites uh, where there was a lot of content on the site. But to find it, you had to go to a search form to actually find links to that content. And for sites like that, pretty much the only way to get to the detailed content was to, to go through the search form. Um, however, for pretty much every modern site, we, we can crawl normally. And people are used to creating a structure where we can crawl with categories and subcategories, where essentially we never need to go through any of the forms. So I would imagine most of the people who have sites, who, who have logs that they can look at, if you look at the server logs and you look at Googlebot, uh, you would probably never see Googlebot submitting any of the, the forms that you have on the site. So that's something that's really extremely, extremely rare. And something usually where when it does happen with a website, it's kind of a sign that we can't crawl normally, uh, where we, we realize there's a lot of content, uh, but we can't actually find that content at all. Uh, so that's something where. If you're seeing this happening, I would kind of go down the direction of like, what, what am I doing wrong? What could I be doing differently with regards to my site's navigational structure? Um, that's, I, I think, the, the primary aspect there. And with, with that in mind, adding more complexity like iframes or other domains, I, I suspect a lot of that would just not happen just for practical reasons, because we want to avoid running into a situation where we accidentally enter things like credit card numbers and accidentally Googlebot goes off and buys things or fills out some contact forms with, with like random information. All of that doesn't really make sense, and it causes almost more problems than it helps anyone. So uh, that's something where. I imagine if you have a configuration with iframes and other domains, you would probably never see Googlebot go through that. Uh, the one thing where sometimes you will see something like this happening is if you have an Ajax-based website or JavaScript-based website in general where you're using some kind of a, a post request to, to get data to load on a page, then that's something where Googlebot might be executing that. So if that's a part of your page's rendering, that it does a post request to an API, and then it gets some answers and displays those answers, then that's something where, when we render the page, we might be doing that. It's not that Googlebot is crawling those post requests for the form data, but just that in the, the in kind of in the process of rendering your page, if there's a post request, we'll try to do what a normal browser would do, and we might show that. And in a case like that, we follow, I, I imagine, the, the normal browser security guidelines. So doing things like cross-domain, I believe, is just uh, a lot harder. I don't know offhand kind of what, what the defaults are there with, with modern browsers. Um, but that's something where it's just like you're adding more complexity again. Um, we, we had two goals in our mind. Uh, the first is showing ratings as rich results uh, for our seller pages when someone searches for seller name plus reviews or ratings. And the second is uh, showing a search box when someone searches for our brand. Uh, in February, for case one, we implemented organization schema on our seller page, okay. added organization attributes like brand name, URL, logo, address, reviews, ratings. Uh, for case two, we implemented site link search box schema on our home page. Uh, the result one, in Search Console enhancement reports, we started seeing logo section, where we have around 250 valid items. Uh, but in performance, we haven't gotten any rich results for seller pages yet. Um, in, and the second, in Search Console section, we started seeing one, one valid item, but we're not seeing any search box when we type a brand name in Google Search. My boss is upset with me now. Um, my thoughts for the next step for the seller pages are remove all organization schema and implement ratings only. Uh, one of our competitors is doing the same. 
uh, is there any hidden mistake that I should take care of? Uh, our main focus is the search box. Uh, so for reviews, you definitely need to watch out for the guidelines that we have with regards to review markup uh, in our developer documentation. Uh, in particular, reviews are only available for a certain set of items uh, that you mark up on a page. So it's not the case that you can take anything and just add reviews, and Google will show those reviews in search. Uh, but rather, we only show them for a certain set of kind of structured data elements. Uh, so I double check to make sure that you're following the guidelines there and that the, the information that you are marking up matches the, the policies that we have for reviews. So that's, that's probably the, the most important part. Uh, with regards to the site link search box, uh, this is kind of a tricky one and something I see people struggle with from time to time. Uh, the, the hard part here is that uh, adding the markup does not make it more likely that, your, that a site link search box will be shown. Uh, but rather, if we were to show one, we would use one that's based on your markup. Uh, so it's very rare, or I don't know, it, it feels very rare that we would show a site link search box in general uh, for queries for sites. And uh, only for those cases where we would show it, if you have the markup, we'll try to use the markup. If you don't have it, we'll just use a default setup. Uh, so that's something where if you're currently not seeing a site link search box at all, then adding the markup for that will have no effect. Um, a question on the FAQ schema. I've seen in documentation what qualifies an FAQ and what not. But for my website, the FAQ was showing for some pages. Uh, don't, now it has disappeared. But in Search Console, I can still see I'm applicable uh, to the FAQ schema. Um, it's really hard to say what, what exactly was happening here. Um, so on, on the one hand, the, the policies are definitely important, so I'd watch out to make sure that you're following the policies. On the other hand, with structured data in general, uh, just because you have marked something up does not guarantee that it's shown in search. Uh, so there, there are various things that come into play here. Uh, on the one hand, it has to be valid markup. It has to follow our policies. Uh, it has to be a site that's kind of a reasonably high quality so that we can kind of trust it. And all of these things have to align. And it's possible that we and things like or some of the other more visible types of markup, it doesn't make sense for us to show this but every URL that's shown in the search results, because every, otherwise everything would just look really messy. Uh, so that's something where also kind of worth looking at the kind of looking at the queries that you're actually targeting and seeing what the results look like there. Um, so that's kind of the, the direction I would go here. Um, question about maintaining multiple TLDs that all contain the same English content. If a company has a .com and expand it to multiple TLDs 10 plus years ago using the same content uh, written in English, um, and the content is generic. Uh, does it make sense to remove the cctlds and fold them together with .com via site migration? Uh, maybe redirect them back to .com. Um, again, the English content is uh, definitely applies to all of those countries, and Google is already choosing the .com as canonical for many of those URLs. Uh, some of the CCTLDs do rank in their country now based on hreflang magic, where Google is choosing .com as canonical and displays the CCTLD in the search results. Maintaining those additional CCTLDs is tough for the company, and it doesn't make sense to keep a complete duplicate of the .com sitting on multiple TLDs. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've already figured out that the CCTLDs aren't as critical uh, for that particular case. Uh, so that's something where maybe it does make sense to fold things together and to kind of pick one version as, as a canonical version. In general, I would use 
uh, country code versions or just generally local versions when you really have something unique that you want to do uh, on a per country basis. So if there are maybe policy reasons or legal reasons why you need to have individual country versions, or if you have different content depending on versions, um, have separate URLs. But uh, if essentially it's all the same content and you just have the these different country versions for historical reasons then probably it makes sense to fold all of those together into one version uh, so that you have one clear, one strong version. Makes it easier for tracking as well. Uh, makes it a lot easier for maintenance, definitely. So that's something where I, I think you've already kind of analyzed that like all of this is duplication that you don't necessarily need. So I, I would tend to fold those together. Can I ask a follow up to that? Sure. Um, just so basically the so if a current brand that's not doesn't want to expand globally and just uh, stay locally and sitting on a dot com for 15 years now is it worth it to go ahead and redirect uh, the dot com to the dot ca um from a tld purpose like i know you guys count that as an immediate uh geo targeting there's no need to do that in search console right it just yeah so is it worth it to go ahead and if they don't want to expand? I, I think that's fine, too. Yeah. So .ca can be active globally as well. It's not uh, that it's like suppressed in other countries. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. from that point of view, if, if you just want to have one version and the .ca is your local, your kind of primary version, then that's, that's perfectly fine, yeah. But the ranking will tank for a little bit and then it come back? I I think if you're folding things together, then I wouldn't worry so much about the ranking because you're kind of taking one one existing site and you're just adding to that. It's not that you're taking two sites and changing them, but right. you're kind of building up on one existing site. So probably from a ranking point of view, that should be fairly stable. OK, thanks. I have another uh, follow-up question on that. Um, so uh, I have a question about X default in like a multi multi uh, lingual site. Uh, so for example, there is a lot of website they actually redirect their uh, root domain to ENUS version, uh, but they put X default to uh, the root domain. So they basically putting a X default to a page. Uh, pointing to a page that being redirect. So does that make sense? I mean, that page is not 200. And um, I think a lot of time, the root domain actually have more backlink than the ENUS um, URL. Um, so in this case, is that is that actually a good idea to just put a root domain uh, uh, root domain as the ENUS alternative in, instead of redirect them to ENUS and put ENUS as uh, ENUS alternative? I, I think in, in, in a case like that, where you have a root URL that's redirecting depending on the country version or like the country of the user, that's, that's something where we've said in the past that using the X default is fine. Uh, essentially, what, what you're saying with the X default there is that on the root URL, you have your own logic for handling users of different countries. And uh, if you tell us, like, these are the known country versions, then we will send people there when we recognize they're from there. But if people from other countries come to your website, you're telling us, please send them to my root URL, and I will decide where they should go. And from our point of view, that's that's a perfectly valid decision for you to make. So, so, uh, so for yeah. what, what I hear is that if they're using browser detection, uh, then it's OK to put X default to a root domain that being redirect. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The the only thing I would watch out for is the individual language and country versions. Don't do the browser detection there. So on the root, do the browser detection. But if you send them to the EN US version, then keep them on the EN US version, even if their the browser happens to be in French suddenly. Yeah. Uh, don't do. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Another follow-up question is that I, I, I heard that it's actually not a good idea to do um, uh, browser detection uh, from Google's guideline. So if, sh 
should we it should we prevent uh, just not doing it on root domain also um uh so for example root domain is just the content of english right so should we just redirect it the root domain to enus no matter what or maybe just put root domain as you enus uh instead of redirecting if we uh, want we don't uh, want to have connection anymore i I think that's that's up to you. From from our point of view, if you have one page where you're doing this kind of browser or um, country detection, that's that's fine as long as we can really access the other versions. So, that's that's kind of the tricky part. Where sometimes we've seen people on the ENUS version, they also check for browser and location, and then they redirect. Uh, which sometimes results in Googlebot finding, for example, the French version, and Googlebot crawls from the US, so it gets redirected to the English version, and then we would never be able to index the French version. But if you only do this kind of detection on the root URL, where there's actually no content, then that's that's not a problem for us. I see, and and uh, that's not so. So in this case, right, we detect in a root uh, br browser. Uh, when people go to the root domain, and root domain has a very high backlink, right? But it redirects different places according to their browser or IP location. How the page page rank work in this case then? Um, so it's it's tricky. Usually, what what would happen is we would see the redirect from the root URL to the English version. And that would be the one that we would use for kind of page rank calculation. Um, but with hreflang, we can swap out the different URLs. So it's something where usually that, that just works out. It's not that you have to do anything special with regards to page rank in a case like that. OK, thank you so much. Sure. Hi, Mr. Mahler. Hi. I am Vahan from Search Engine Journal. So uh, we were experimenting with Google Newsstand app and uh, built there a sections of our website by submitting by submitting either an RSS or web location. So on certain categories, we don't have an app. And uh, we have to submit their uh, web location. But when I open a Google News app on the phone, open the section on the app, I have found that articles are not sorted by the freshness. They are sorted by kind of like relevancy. And the uh, first article I see, like I see articles uh, from March. And uh, the most fresh articles in that case are pushed like a uh, bottom. But sometimes I see fresh ones first. So is this something that was done intentionally, or is a kind of bug? I have no idea. I don't know how, how the Google search, uh, News app de deals with those kind of things. In intuitively, I, I think it's something I, I mean, I, I only see this in Discover when, when I look at Discover. But in, in there, I, I feel that's something where we try to understand what the relevance is. And sometimes it's just not the newest stuff is, is the most relevant. But I have no idea how that's handled on the Google News side. So that's something where it's probably worth checking with, with the Google News team. Uh, for I believe in the News Publisher Help Center, there is a, a contact form that you can use. Uh, where you should be able to reach out to someone from the Google News team, and maybe they can help you with this. I mean, it's a bit of a tricky question because it's almost like a ranking question. Um, but uh, especially if you find something that looks to you more like a bug rather than kind of like a misunderstanding, then that's something I I would let them know. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mahler. I, I've seen that as well, and have given uh, the news team feedback about that. It used to also be on desktop. You only had articles on Google News from the last 30 days. And now sometimes they'll be months old. And it's like it's it's old news sometimes uh, on Google News. <laughs> okay. when, when, when we did use a feed as a section source, it does pull order correctly by the freshness. And when, but when we dis, did switch to a web location, and I want to the add to it that we have a list item schema implemented in our category pages. So it uh, states the order of the articles. 
by that schema as well, which can help Google understand the order. So uh, web location kind of uh, works differently. Okay. Yeah, the on the on the publisher center, the web crawl, the web location does not seem to work as reliably as crawling it from a feed. Yeah, if, if yes. you have generating yes. generating it generating the articles by the feed, it's much more reliable. Yes, the, but, but the question is, the problem there is uh, if we generate non app articles from feed, it is going to app inside the news app, but we want traffic to come to a website. Right. Uh, yeah, and from then for feed, that, you have to have the app. Yeah, we have M, but on certain categories, we don't have M. Right. So that is a problem. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, Chris! I think we need to do a special <laughs> session just with you. Uh, Sorry, didn't mean to your publisher your form here. <laughs> no, no, this is perfect. Uh, it's it's always like people coming in with these kind of news publisher questions, and I'm like, I have no idea. And you're you're one of the people that has the most experience in this. So cool to have you. Here. Um, what's the status of Google's decision on the mobile-first indexing after September? Uh, any delay due to COVID-19? Uh, so, so far, we're still seeing lots of sites shifting over and uh, getting ready uh, for mobile-first indexing. So we, we haven't completely made up our mind that we will stick with this date, but we want to give it a little bit more time to, to settle down and see how, how it works out. My Guess is within the next month or so we'll we'll make that call and go one way or the other. Uh, it's also really useful to have feedback from any of you who are running into issues around this, where you're seeing that your development team just isn't available to to make these kind of changes or anything around that. Um, the the more feedback we have, the easier it is to just make a decision on this because otherwise we just see. Sites are being improved, and we think, oh, well, people are still doing the good work, kind of getting things ready, so maybe we don't need to change the date. Uh, but send us feedback. Um, question about cloaking. Uh, the case that, that we have with a site with millions of URLs is gr growing, and we want to manage crawl budget uh, efficiently. Oh, I think this is the, the parameter yeah. question that we looked at in the beginning. Yes, sir. that's right. OK. Uh, um, is there anything more that you have that we, we should cover in that regard? Uh, yes, and so uh, ju ju uh, just to make a statement and say that uh, this, is, this would technically, technically be called as cloaking uh, in terms of statements, right? Uh, um, yeah. I, I think it's tricky uh, with with just that name because there's so many different ways that a website can be dynamic and kind of subtly be different. Um, for us, what is what is really problematic when it comes to cloaking is when uh, the content is significantly different. So when when for example you you have a web page about cars and when Googlebot crawls it, it's a it's a web page about pharmaceuticals, then. That's that's really hard for us, and that's something where the web spam team might get involved. On the other hand, if you're just adding parameters to individual URLs, that's something where we we tend not to worry too much about that. But generally, you would probably advise to not do it and have a better way of uh, solving it. Yeah, I. That's generally what what we advise anyway, just because it makes all of the maintenance and debugging so much easier. So it's, it's very common that we run across situations where um, maybe someone from the indexing team will contact us and say, please contact this website and tell them to stop cloaking. And then they give us details, which basically say they're showing Googlebot something broken, and they're showing users something that works, and they're shooting themselves in the foot. And they don't realize it, because when they look at the website themselves, it looks fine. But when Googlebot looks at it, it looks broken. Got it. Uh, Got so it. that's something where it, it's very easy to break things in subtle ways. So if you can stick to one version, it just makes it so much easier. Got it. Thank you so much, John. Uh, uh, hey, John. I have a question that's related sure. to the unknown traffic that we are receiving. I don't know if it's coming from a spam bot. 
but while checking analytics, the traffic is coming from California. We are based out of India. Uh, and also, I've checked the source. It's coming from Facebook. And the average session duration is less than 0.2 seconds. Even I checked the IP log data, but I'm not able to arrive at a solution. So is there any way that I've missed? Or can you just suggest me any solution? I don't know. Uh, so the. The IP address comes from Facebook, or the referrer comes from Facebook, or what? What are you seeing? Uh, the IP log data that I've taken it from our website, so we have not checked anything from Facebook side. Okay, um, I don't know. So, in in general, if you're seeing something like this, where uh, it's it's not coming from Google crawling, and it's it looks maybe it looks like bot traffic or it looks like traffic that is irrelevant for your website in general. Uh, then, from our point of view, just purely from from a search side, you you're welcome to block that traffic um, because at, at least from from our point of view, if we feel that normal users, when we send them to your website, they're seeing a normal uh, experience. And uh, if you're blocking traffic that you don't want to have access your website. That's essentially up to you between you and those users that you're blocking. And if you feel that these requests are not actually made from users at all, and they don't provide you any value for your website, then maybe that's something that you could just block. Oh. Is there any way that I can just block them? Because I'm not able to arrive, like I'm not able to get the IP location. So how is that I block them? Um, that depends on on your server and on the setup that you have. So yeah, check the server logs. Yeah. Yeah. Some sometimes you can check the server logs. Some sometimes that's something where you can just block an IP IP uh, range uh, directly on the server and say like don't respond to these IP addresses. Um, it might also be the case that your website is set up in a way that you don't easily have access to that information. You can't easily block things. And sometimes a workaround might be to use something like a content delivery network in between, uh, which does give you a little bit more functionality in that regard. Uh, so that's something where you need to kind of check it out with the, the technical people working on your website and work with them to kind of find ways to, to block that kind of traffic. OK. Uh, Hi, John. Hi. Hi. Um, I have two questions for you today. <clears throat> um, so the first is actually about Ajax calls. Um, so I was happy to see that Martin is here. Hi. <laughs> um, so uh, not actually a dev, so I might get some of the details a little muddled. But um, so we have an infinite scroll implementation that uh, uses an Ajax call to fetch the. Uh, it's for a category page of articles, so the Ajax calls to fetch more articles. Um, and the variable for the Ajax call is like a URL, I guess, that doesn't exist. So it's not a page. It just uh, responds with a JSON response. Um, and those URLs are being indexed um, by, by Google. So they were appearing in Search Console. Um, initially, we had a, a bug where when there was nothing to, when there was no data, um, so for category pages that didn't have enough content, let's say, um, they were producing a 500 error instead of the JSON response. Um, so that's when we noticed that these were being picked up by Google. So that the 500 errors are fixed now, but the um, URLs are still being indexed. Um, so I, I don't know uh, what the best way to handle these URLs are or if we should even do anything to them. Like, would it be best to uh, just let them be indexed? Because um, I'm not sure how that affects the rendering of the page, like if we let them be indexed, is it the case that then Google can see um, the additional articles that are being loaded with the call? Um, is it the case that we should like try to prevent those URLs from being indexed and, and crawled at all um, for like the sake of crawl budget or whatever? Um, yeah, I'm just not really sure what the best way to handle it is. OK. Um, so I, I think they're, they're Probably those two aspects that uh, that are important there. On the one hand, the rendering, uh, mm -hmm. which is, is something where I would not block them in a way that they would block rendering, just so that you really 
kind of have your pages rendered completely. So as much as possible, we can get to all of your content. So don't block those JSON requests with something like a robots text, because that would prevent us from actually loading the content. Uh, that's, that's the one thing. The other thing is with regards to indexing, uh, where like one, one way that you could block those from being indexed is to use an xrobots tag HTTP header, uh, which is kind of something that you specify in the response uh, on the server side where you say, this file, like here's the content, but please don't index it. That's, that's something that you could do. Um, from, from a technical route, Sorry, um, if we go that route, um, will it not no index the, like, the main page? No. Nope. No, OK. That's what Ooh, people were okay. so I was a little unclear about that. People said that uh, someone said they did that with a, with a robots no index in the, in the X robots header, and it prevented uh, the parent page from being indexed. No, that, that shouldn't be happening. If, if you see something like that happening, that would be a bug, and that would be something that we'd want to fix. So okay. that, that definitely shouldn't be happening. The other thing that, that I think is also worth mentioning here is that probably it doesn't matter if these pages are indexed, uh, because most likely the content in those JSON files will be content that you have in the rendered version of your page already. And the rendered version of your page is a normal HTML page, and we can understand that page really well. So if someone searches for words in that content, we will show your HTML page. We won't show the JSON file. Uh, so technically, it'll be indexed. And theoretically, you could do a query and, and make that appear in search. But for all practical purposes, it doesn't matter at all. So mm -hmm. it's something where I'd say like you can use the xrobots tag to block it from being indexed, but it's, it's not critical. It's like a nice way to clean things up but it's not going to make or break anything for your website. And also okay. on crawl budget, it doesn't make a difference on crawl budget because we have to make the request anyway. So if we do it, you're indexing it and then put it in the cache, and then when you do the Ajax call, we use it from the cache. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, if you would no index it, um, we would still have to crawl it when you make the uh, Ajax request. So that's why you should not put it in robots.txt. Okay. Uh, because if you put it in robots.txt and disallow us from crawling, then we can't fetch that content anymore, and then we're not seeing the content in the JSON file. So yeah, as long okay. as it's not ranking on anything that you care for, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a question on the crawler budget. So can I? Sure. sure. So uh, 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 we are the news publisher, and we are filing uh, 350 story uh, every day, average 350 story. And suddenly, uh, some big news came, and we filed 500 to 1,000 stories on that day. So uh, uh, the, after the 350 this story, that will crawlable on same day or not? Or what is the best uh, practice for that? Probably it doesn't matter. So I yeah, so. If, if you look at your server logs, I'm guess so I, I don't know your website, but I'm guessing you see that we do multiple thousands of requests every day uh, from your website. So if you have 300 articles, you have 500 articles, that's, that difference is so small compared to like those several thousands of pages that we request every day. So from, from that point of view, I. I don't think that would make a big difference. I think it would be different if you went from 300 articles on one day to 30,000 articles on the next day. That's oh, something where it's like, OK, there's a significant difference. And then we might have trouble keeping up. Uh, but just from a practical point of view, I think that would be hard. OK, uh, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, uh, we are the news publisher, and we have the brand name. So uh, if people search our brand name in SERP, then suddenly we see uh, our website, then we uh, uh, website news article appearing on top of the our brand in Google. The first, if I search my brand name, the uh, news article of third third website, which is also publisher, we both are we both are the publisher. So uh, the third party uh, URL above than our brand name. So uh, and we are the bigger than 
that uh, website so how we can it's very uh, uh, difficult to how we can handle this because we are the bigger brand then we are the double than uh, which publisher uh, uh, rank above than us okay I so this to you and you responded and i am not feeling i i re, uh, i question over there so it is, this is the best, best platform to ask you and your help yeah so I, I think it would be useful to have some screenshots of what what exactly you're seeing because it's I it's have. hard for me to to understand uh, but it's also something where what what we would not do is make any kind of manual adjustments for for those kind of cases. So it's it's very possible that in some situations, if you search for maybe a company name, that a news article about that company will rank above it. It's 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 certainly possible. I think seeing that regularly or always with different news articles uh, about a company that would be kind of awkward, especially if it's a if it's a reasonable company. Um, but but seeing it like once or twice, I I think that would be kind of expected. It's started after the COVID nineteen coverage. Okay, and only for the it's uh, applicable for only COVID nineteen live blog. That publisher published live blog on COVID, and that live blog appear above than us, even on brand name. Only we are using brand name, our brand okay. name. He. Her article above than us. Okay, that that sounds like something where it'd be useful to to get some examples. Uh, if you can post maybe some details in the chat, or if you can send them to me on Twitter, then I I'd, I'd love to take a look at that and pass that on. Yeah, I will post. Yeah. yeah, cool. Thank you. Sure. Uh, John, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, what what's the difference between no refer and no follow? Because I see that sometimes when I look at different coding of things? And is there one that's preferable in certain circumstances? Um, so they, they do different things. Uh, the nofollow is essentially something that we use or search engines use to not pass signals from one URL to the next one with a link. And the no refer is something that uh, browsers use to kind of block the refer from being shown on the other page. So usually, if you click on a link that goes to a different website, it would say, this user came from that referring website. And the no refer attribute basically just says, like, don't, don't say anything about where you came from. And usually, that makes sense for, for cases where maybe the URL itself is something that is perhaps private, private data. Like, for example, you could imagine a social network where the URLs have a long ID. And if you go to that ID directly, you can see the content, even if it's not for you directly. So you might want to have cases like that where if someone clicks on a link, not include that kind of URL itself. Uh, so that's something where like, so, some people choose to do that. I, I think some CMSs have some defaults as well with regards to how they mark up the different links. I don't know if no refer is one of those things that people just use. Uh, there's also no opener, which is another attribute that a lot of CMSs use. Um, I forgot what that one does. I don't know if it like prevents it from opening in a new tab or something, something weird like that. I, I don't know. OK, thank you. Sure. Hey, uh, I have another question. Uh, so this is just uh, a question about um, uh, 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 fashion navigation. So a uh, big website. Uh, previous, what I did is that I, I, I blocked uh, all the all the fashion navigation in robot.txt. But I recently I re read uh, in the webmaster blog, they say that um, it's actually not necessarily the best practice because some of the higher level uh, fast navigation might be useful to be indexed, and also that don't consolidate pro, uh, the, the, the authority of those pages. So uh, if I want to uh, change the robot.txt role right now, the, uh, there will be a bunch of URLs suddenly being crawlable. Will they, how hard it will be to hurt my crawl budget? And should I care about crawl budget since Google are so powerful nowadays? And also, uh, should I only uh, 
let higher level parameter to be crow or should I just open all of them to be crow and then ca canonicalize them? Yeah, so I, I think with crawl budget in general, most sites don't need to worry about this. It's something where I, I would say just to, to give an order of magnitude, if it's less than tens of millions of pages, probably you don't need to worry about crawl budget. Uh, if, if it's more than that, then it's really something where if you're suddenly duplicating or triplicating all of the URLs on your website, then that makes it a lot harder for us to crawl things. But if it's a couple hundred thousand pages and suddenly they're twice as many, then we, we can usually just deal with that. Uh, with regards to faceted navigation, by if you were to unblock that in robots text, I think you would see a kind of a rise in the amount of crawling that we would do, at least temporarily, until we figured out how these parameters actually work. And that's something where, depending on the site, you might see that affecting the rest of the crawling as well for, for a period of time, where I'd say, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks, something around that time. Uh, so that's kind of where I'd say, if you want to make that kind of a significant change, then maybe pick a time uh, where crawling from search is not as critical for your website. Uh, so if you have maybe a, a season where there is less traffic from search, where you have fewer new products, fewer new articles, then that would be a good time to change that around. Uh, whereas if everything is under fire and like your website is already running kind of at its limits, then that's probably a bad time to make significant changes like that. So would you say that the better way to deal with such navigation is not blocked in by robot.txt, it's canonicalized? Yeah, to canonicalize or use no index, that's essentially what, what we would recommend. Yeah. OK, thank you so much. Sure. All right, I need to jump off to, to another meeting. Uh, it's been great having you all here. Uh, thank you all for joining in. It's so cool John, to have one, so many people in. John, John, one more question, please. Thank you. One really quick uh, one. One really okay. quick one. We have a uh, news website called lalantop.com. Earlier, that website appearing in Google uh, 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 top browser. But since three, three to four months, the website is not appearing in uh, Google top browser on any of the keywords. So just want to know what we have to do for that and, and what is the next process and i didn't i didn't get any information regarding how to came back in top story crowders so please yeah. help i i don't have any kind of magic tricks for top stories so okay. that's something where it's it's an organic feature and we use normal ranking uh, algorithms in there so what I would recommend doing in a case like this is going to the Webmaster Help Forum and getting as much input from other people as possible and thinking about what, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense for your particular case. OK. It's not, not that I have like email, it's something I can do. Thank cool. You so All right. All right, cool. Um, I, need, I really need to jump off. Uh, thank you all for, for sticking around. Um, I have the next ones lined up for Friday and Thursday if you speak German, uh, so we can stay in touch then. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, John. Thank you, John.